Calvin, even though it was uh, 46 years ago, how vivid is your memory of that night? Can you still see it exactly now as it happened? I could probably see it better now than what I could then because I've actually been under hip hypnosis and all to help sharpen all. And, and that don't do anything, but just kind of help you sharpen a few details out. And I've had it in my attention and I've been to conventions and talked about it. And, you know, I, I could see it good now, better now than what I could back then. Cause I, I ain't gonna lie to nobody. I was scared to death then. Yeah. Yeah. I can imagine. Can imagine. And you're scared of something. You will, uh, you know, you take 20 different people and they could all see a crime or something taken forward, but no two stories would be alike. Yeah. Can, can you briefly describe to us what, what happened? Absolutely. This was uh, October 11th, 1973. And actually my first day to work, I had come down. I was getting married in November and this was October. The, I was going to get married November the 9th. So I wanted to find a, be, uh, a job where I wasn't working 16 hours a day, seven days a week. And, you know, that's what we did back in. Everybody just worked. So uh, I called Charles Hickson up and got a job with him at the F.B. Walker and Sons Shipyard. And my first day at work there, he asked me, D would you want to go fishing? And I said, sure, Charlie. You know, that sounds good. I said, but I got a problem. I didn't bring any of my fishing equipment. He said, well, I, you know, I have plenty of equipment. So... We're going to buy the house and, and get you know, for a man south to loan you fish equipment. He just soon give you his firstborn or his wife or something else because that just don't happen. I mean, you know, that's a big gesture for someone being on the coast down here from the south. So we went by and we got the fishing equipment and we, we was in my car and we drove over to uh, the grain elevator first. Now, while we was uh, fishing at the grain elevator, the bugs got so bad, we just couldn't stand it. And uh, I said, you know, Charlie, I can stand a lot of things, but I just can't stand what's going on now. Something you can't see biting you as big as a giraffe's mouth or something. He said, well, I know another spot. Maybe that won't be that bad. So we left and went to uh, the old Shaw Pitter shipyard, which is on the east bank. Well, it's on the east bank of the river. We was on the east bank, but we was on the west side of the east bank. And we got to get out of the car, and I noticed it was a bunch of trash and debris around. And I had mentioned to Charlie, Lord, look, why don't they keep this place up? And I said, Charlie, there's a no trespassing sign here. We fix to get a lot of trouble fishing here. Oh, he said, I fish here all the time, and as far as the trash, when the tide comes in, it washes all this mess up. Or when the water gets high, then when it goes out, it just leaves it. And there ain't no way to keep picked up after it. So I took him at his word. I took him at his word about the trespassing. So we just kind of walked by the trespassing sign and got down to the pier. We pulled an old log up and sat on the pier. And I remember I was sitting there looking across the river at a steel ship now it never really clicked on me until this day because i had was working in the shipyard how does something made out of steel float and i just couldn't understand it and now you know i know they make them out of concrete and everything else but uh while i was looking at this ship across and i think it was old noah ship or maybe a coast guard cutter i noticed some lights reflecting it across the water it was some hazy blue lights and uh i told charlie or i was thinking to myself yeah i'm going to jail now before we we trespassing down here and they fixing to run us off well about that time we both stood up and turned around and when we did the light got so bright it was like a big spotlight they had put on us and uh it was blinding almost you just barely couldn't see anything. But when our sight started coming back, and this was fast too, there was three bulky looking creatures that was coming out of this craft. 
and they was just kind of gliding across the top of the marsh grass. Well, as they got closer, I noticed, you know, or, or I was looking and they looked like big green bay packers coming toward us. They didn't have a neck or uh, their head just kind of set all the way down on their shoulders and all. And two of them reached and got a hold of Charlie and one of them got a hold of myself. Well, here I was thinking about somewhere to run, but it wasn't anywhere to run because we had water in the front with a lot of debris in it, water on the left side of me and water on the right being out on that pier. Thinking back, now what I should have done was just took Charlie and put him up there in front of me and let him get him and me leave, but you know, it didn't quite work that way. But uh, anyhow, two of them got a hold of Charlie, one got a hold of myself, and immediately when he grabbed me by the left arm, I felt an injection of some kind, or I heard a little poof of air, what I really heard, and uh, I was relaxed. I wasn't scared no more. So later we determined that that was some kind of a, something to get you, knock the edge off where you wasn't so scared. Well, they've levitated this, or levitated me, now I lost sight of Charlie, floated me up to the front door of the craft, and I was just thinking about where did all these bright lights come from? And I was looking inside when we got to the door and it was looked like it was coming out of the paint. Looked like it was just made there. And this thing got to the door and paused for a second, made the left turn. Then he made a right turn, went down a hall a little ways, turned right. It took me into what I call the examination room. And there was one of the most beautiful tables you ever seen in your life. Look at like it was probably a glass or some crystal clear. It's actually a pretty table, you know, and I, I was sitting there looking, all I could do was look look forward. I couldn't really move nothing. I could roll my eyes and roll my head, and that was about it. And this big ugly thing put me on this examination table and uh I'm going to call him a robot because that's the way he moved mechanical wise. He didn't act like he had any kind of uh, sensations and all about him. Well, he laid me at an angle on this uh, table and I was laying down looking straight up at the ceiling. And I noticed there's something about the size of a deck of cards. It was a little blue on the bottom and it come down and it stopped about a foot and a half in front of my head. This thing started circling my head, and as it would circle about every quarter turn, it would do, give a clicking noise. And then when it clicked a few times, it got back up in front of my head and stopped, and then it shot back up into the ceiling. And that was the end of the clicking. But I could sense another presence there besides the old big ugly one that was over in the corner now. By this time, he moved over there, and he just shut down, more or less. But uh, I could sense that there was something coming toward me, and I rolled my head a little bit, and this is where the, uh, and I'm calling her female, and I don't know if she was or not. I, don't, I really don't know if it was male, female, or what it was, but she favored a female, and uh when she communicated, not by voice, but telepathically, she did it in a female's voice. So she came over and the first thing she did was grab me by the cheek. And I did notice her fingers, her hands, on her two middle fingers on both her hands was a little longer than the average human hand. Now the old robotic looking creature, he had like, crab-like hands or mitten hand on his hands, but she had normal looking hands with the exception of the two fingers. Well, she kind of rubbed my cheek. I didn't feel any sensation whatsoever of warmth or feelings or anything. No, couldn't smell any smells. But the shocking thing, the next thing she did was took her other hand, pushed down on my chin, and she took the two middle fingers and she run down my throat Wow. and was trying to come up behind that little thing that hangs down in back of your throat. I don't know what the uh, technical term is for it, but it, it just hangs down back there. Mm -hmm. And I started choking. I couldn't breathe. 
her nose started bleeding. So she automatically just pulled out. Now this is the only communication I had with her then. And uh, she said telepathically, her mouth didn't move because I was sitting there looking at it. And I was about to choke still. She says, we're not going to harm you. But it was in like an old redneck girl's voice, like somebody, you know, I would talk to most mm. all the time. And I didn't understand that they was from somewhere else. And I, and I really wasn't for sure then where they was from. And she said, we're not going to harm you. Then she made a mumble noise. And she did that verbally uh, with her uh, throat. And the old big ugly went in the creek corner over there, popped up like a jack in the box. And he come back over to me, grabbed me by the left arm again. And this is when I felt another injection going in my arm. And it just kind of settled me down. He carried me out, set me down, about the same spot he put me out, except I was facing the river this time with my arms stretched out. Now, this is the first time I've heard Charlie. He said, Calvin, Calvin, you okay, son? And uh, then we turned around and looked at the craft. We both, he was on the ground. He stood up about the same time I did. And we turned around and looked. And this thing just picked up off the ground a little bit. Then when it did, when it got up a little ways, it just disappeared into the sky. It was so fast, like a streak of lightning. Can, can you estimate how long how long it all took? You know, I would be lying if I said, but according to uh, the time that we called the sheriff department and they came out and picked us up and the time that we got to the fishing pier, this was probably around 5.30 because the full, we had a good full moon that night. And about 11 o'clock before I left the sheriff department and we, we was in there probably for an hour. So it was a pretty good while inside this craft. It didn't seem like it, but you know, we spent a good deal of time in there. Did, um, did Charles um, go through the same thing that you, you were put through? You know, to be real honest with you, I never talked to Charlie. I don't know. Uh, what he went through, me and him never really talked about what happened. The only conversation we had was Charlie said when we got out to the pier, well, we need to uh, go tell somebody. So tell somebody what? Nothing happened to me. I don't want to tell nobody nothing, Charlie. We don't need to tell nobody this. Because that was my first day on the job and I didn't want them to think I was crazy and I didn't want them to get fired. I was fixing to get married. Uh, I didn't want my in-laws to think I was a slap idiot or my fiance, mm -hmm. you know, cause things just didn't happen like that, that you heard about back then. Yeah. Um, Calvin, I read somewhere where you say you're still searching for answers on, on, on what happened that night. So you still think there is, um, there are blank spots that you, you still need to find out about. Well, you know, that's something I'm not real sure about. I I know it's a lot that I need to find out about and, and a lot of others also need to find out about. Uh, but yeah, I'm still hunting answers on the truth. You know, I just mainly who were they? Where were they from? And how come they picked me out of all these billions of people on this world? But you know, now that I've been going to these conventions and all, listen to other people, I know, you know, I'm not just the only one that's ever been abducted. You know, it's a lot more that has. Yeah. So uh, I just keep an open mind about it.